Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Recovery, our ongoing series that we started a year ago in March after the pandemic was declared to answer or at least consider the question of what then is a library if the building is closed? Of course, the libraries themselves weren't closed, but their buildings were. And that then suggested a number of aspects to explore like internet access and digital services, even physical materials and uh, uh, social infrastructure. So those created kind of the avenues for us to explore as we have over the past year. Now session 46 in the series, uh, as we've been able to gather most every week and talk about one aspect or another, we've had over a hundred uh, presenters and some 5,000 uh, have registered for the series. So it just keeps going along and people keep showing up. So we keep doing it. And today is session 46 and we're gonna welcome Patty Wong, the incoming uh, ALA president who takes <laughs> office next month. And uh, we also welcome, uh, let me give credit to the producers and hosts here. We're Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, we're an open consortium of, of uh, tech innovating libraries, um, different parts of the world doing interesting things, mostly with communications technology. Uh, and our host uh, is IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in Den Haag, uh, The Hague in Netherlands. And we'll also hear from their head of public policy, Stephen Weiber, who is at the controls there. These sessions are then recorded and posted on the pandemic response page there on Gigabit Libraries, giglibraries.net, where they are transcribed, closed caption, and translated into uh, over a dozen languages. Or so uh, we have Patty, our featured speaker today. So happy to have you, Patty. And then Stephen will uh, join Patty in, in a kind of a, as a respondent and and provide some international context, of course. So Patty's going to talk to us about uh, you know the, well I'll get to that. But first we turn to the uh, the COVID report, which is kind of the context for these. This is a this is why we started is, is this thing has just overnight transformed civilization, has just had to bend itself around where this virus will let us be and do for the most part and massive shifts. And of course, uh, some terrible tragedies in terms of, of uh, illnesses and death. Um, the vaccines are very good. Uh, the variants are not so good, but maybe they're not that bad. At least it seems so for the moment. And that is if you're vaccinated. And, and also for now, as we just are not quite sure what they're going to do, uh, the virus that is, uh, as they mutate. Um, it sets up this kind of framework, we can say, libraries in recovery and redesign. Uh, nobody now is, is presuming we're going back to what it used to be, the so-called normal. We started talking about a new normal. Okay, well, that's fine as a word, but you know, what does it mean as a term? Um, one thing that it means is that it doesn't seem that we're going to be finished with this virus. It's not going to be like smallpox where we're going to eradicate it. Uh, it's, it's too pervasive. Uh, anytime soon. So between the, uh, uh, the, the hesitancy of people to get vaccinated, you can see that here the, we've just almost, I was hoping we'd hit 150 million today, just as a round number, but you know, doesn't really matter. But the, the, the fall off in the number of doses, it's an extraordinary uh, curve there. The number of people that were actually vaccinated in those three months there uh, through the end of April. Uh, and then now it's falling off dramatically. And so, well, that's only 150 million. We got 330 million or so people in the country. Uh, and this I thought was a really interesting graph of uh, a survey of who would 
probably not or definitely not get vaccinated or would otherwise get vaccinated. And, you know, it's you can draw your own conclusions from this map, but uh, not everybody, obviously. And so it's something on the order of 30 percent are, are are doubtful or sure that they will not vaccinate. Uh, the other aspect besides the hesitancy is the, the rampant expansion of the number of people that have this illness with India being in the news today. And uh, that was last week's curve, astonishing vertical. People talk about hockey sticks, that is just straight up. And it's still climbing like mad. Now over 400,000 a day. And, and they're saying this is a, a, a gross undercount, that this could be three to five times the, uh, the, the actual number could be three to five times greater. So that looks like well over a million cases a day and maybe 10,000 people are succumbing every day in India. Well, that's a tragedy, of course. It's a, it's a horrible tragedy. But at the same time, all those cases, those hundreds of thousands or millions of cases uh, are act as their own kind of laboratories for the virus to mutate and find weaknesses in the immune system and in the vaccines. So it's not just we're showing US numbers, but this is a global phenomenon. This is a global event and we're not safe until we're all safe or we're more or less all kind of safe in a, in a, in a approximate uh, degree with each other. Because if it's out there and it's mutating, we just don't know. So what does that mean for library design? What does it mean for reopening? How, do, how will these spaces be managed? If, how are you going to have people come in if you don't know? Are they vaccinated? Are they not vaccinated? How far apart are you going to have everybody, allow everybody? It seems like that we've learned that uh, air circulation is, is critical. We talk about this distance of six feet, but there was just a study that showed that you're no safer at six feet than you are at 60 feet if the air is not really turning over because the, the way the air moves, we've seen in some prior cases where the virus can collect in an area, a corner of a space. And if you have to be sitting there for an amount of time, you have some serious exposure. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's a major uh, consideration in, in space use and, and distances. As a matter of fact, we have a, uh, a session scheduled next week. Pardon me just a moment here. A session scheduled next week on design. <coughs> Pardon me. That's not an indication of it's not a symptom. It's a little hay fever. I thought about that hay fever. She said hay fever to somebody that didn't know the language. They probably recoil. Are you sick? Oh, no, it's just a little allergy, sorry. Um, but the, uh, uh, the point is that uh, what I was about to say is we're next week, we're having a, a pair of architects come on to address this very topic of how we're rethinking the space and spaces. And this is a survey, Ginsler, it's a major firm that will be represented next week, did the survey and rank these responses from people and what they valued in the library. Uh, I, I can't remember whether this was pre-pandemic or during pandemic, but in either case, I think it's applicable. The social services, the, the, the more about spaces than space. So specialized uh, spaces in the library for, for meetings and telehealth interviews. So we're gonna have a session on telehealth coming up. Uh, Pop-ups, booking bills, low touch kiosk out into the community as Many of you who've been on before uh, know that's a, uh, a high priority for Gabit Libraries Network. We think this is just a real opportunity for libraries to extend themselves out into the community, as we've been talking about forever, and, and do it by offering connectivity, which is something that's pretty universal. And that, especially in the pandemic, when, when the digital divide, so-called, has been exacerbated <coughs> to an extraordinary degree, and the number of people that have relied on the library for internet access, not to mention the digital service, just to open internet access, required that all roughly 80 million people, a huge number of people that access the internet at a library, had to come to one of the 17,000 facilities 
which while they have those, that's great. Uh, it does require people to travel. And many people, that means they have to take time and probably get on public transportation, which these days is somewhat hazardous. So why not extend that particular service into places that are more accessible to people? You know, every neighborhood we're saying should have a library point of access. Now, however much, it, what shape, is it a picnic table? Is it a phone booth? You know, whatever that looks like. Is it a, is it a corner in the city hall? Is it a community center? Is it a, uh, a shelter in the park? Wherever that is, uh, these should be close to everybody. They should be within you know, 10 minutes walk of everybody because they're just not that expensive and they're super valuable, both for access for people who don't have it, which is a terrible thing that that's all you have, but sometimes you know things happen you lose connectivity you lose electricity so if there's a backup then that can be extremely valuable in certain scenarios uh, uh, which are increasingly common due to extreme weather events driven by the climate change so this year this last year has been as everybody will recall has just been a cascade of of crises you know the pandemic these severe weather driven events, fires and floods, and hurricanes, and tornadoes. And then we had uh, the, the Floyd killing and then that has unleashed this pent up social pressure that's been building for so long. This just has to be addressed. Uh, and and it's just it's just kept going. And so it seems like that's the new normal is crises. And so people tend to turn to the library in a crisis, whether it's a personal crisis or regional or a global crisis. They look to libraries for some kind of an answer or support. Uh, but this is, a, this is an interesting set of uh, preferences and we'll, we'll grill Gensler next week on when that was done. So to the session uh, and enough of the introduction, thank you all for, for bearing with me. Uh, Patty is here for us today. She's also the director of Santa Monica Public Library, beautiful facility uh, right there on the coast, uh, west of Los Angeles. Uh, and Patty is, uh, as I mentioned, is the incoming president of ALA. She takes office next, next month. Uh, and so she's going to give us both a, a local story. She's a, you know, a library director of a local library. She's been through all the things that all the other directors have been through, uh, you know, variations, of course, but you'll relate. And then, and then also give us a national perspective on, on the association, where she sees it, uh, it going and taking us. And then we'll have a, uh, we'll have a wide, even wider, we'll have local, national, and international context with Stephen, who many of you know as our uh, cohort in these series and, and at the uh, controls there in the Hague recording, who also is the manager uh, of policy and advocacy for IFLA, uh, IFLA.org, if, if you're curious. Uh, and so he'll help Patty uh, explore the international aspects. And so we'll have, this is the first time we've had this kind of local, national, global sort of view on, on libraries. And so with that, I will stop sharing and I will welcome Patty to our series and so so happy to have you patty and absolutely congratulations on your election uh i i read your wikipedia we hadn't had a chance to meet before but you've done a lot of stuff and been involved in a lot of activities so i think uh, the association looks like they made a good choice so welcome uh to libraries in recovery and maybe reinvention and take it away patty we see your slides, but we don't see you or hear you. Okay, I just had to unmute. As we uh, all know, okay. you know that's that's one of the things that we've had to deal with in this pandemic is have stronger use of technology in doing all of our work. So, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for inviting me, Don, um, and for Gigabit Lib Libraries Network and for IFLA for being a strong part of our of our global community. Um, right. Patty, is, so your, is your camera on? It is, I think. It is, it's I, working here, Dom. 
Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Very good. All right. I'm glad everything's in working order. Um, and thank you for that warm welcome and that great introduction. Um, you know, technology access today is, um, it wasn't always thought perhaps of as an equity issue, but it certainly is. Uh, throughout the pandemic, libraries, as you've noted, have been vital resources for information, for debunking fake news associated with the pandemic, along with other things, for healthcare and vaccination access, um, and, and for providing some basic services. We've had to pivot, literally, um, and figuratively in many ways to try to provide as much service as possible to our communities who need us um, so greatly. Let me just go to the, I don't know why my next slide. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about relationships today and partners. Don and I did a little bit of briefing before, and um, I wanted to take at least the United States back to where we were in 1997 when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation initiated the Gates Library Foundation in the U.S., and all of our libraries got maybe five, maybe seven public access computers in, the, in our public libraries. And imagine how much... Oops. Can you still see my screen? I just wanted to double check. Yes, no, we got a flash of something there. That's okay, that's good. No, that, that's fine. You know, if anything, what we know to be true is that flexibility becomes our middle name, right? And we have to adapt accordingly. But what I, what I wanted to really um, talk about very briefly is, can you imagine a world without this kind of access through your library? And, um, and it's really evolved over time since 97. And it's re really made libraries, whether you're public, school, academic, or special, really vital to community development. And, um, oh, you don't see our, my screen. Let me go back. I see you need that's to okay. reach there. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. That's all right. I, 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 no worries. Let me just go back. Apparently, floor manager is also a role, even when you haven't got a floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you all see me now? Yes. <laughs> can you see my screen? That's fantastic. Good. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, so when you think about in 1997 with this, we had this wonderful opportunity to create stronger access for every community member. Um, and we all started very small, we all grew. And now um, the public, our communities actually cannot even think about um, not having access through our through our libraries through to, to, through technology, the FCC, as Don mentioned, has indicated through their report. Um, I think it was done in um, it was filed in September 2020. Um, more than 80 million people in the U.S. still do not have strong connectivity. That's a huge number of people. So they are searching wherever they can to get that Wi-Fi. And of course, they're coming to their local libraries. And in fact, in Yolo County, where I was before, we, um, sorry, I'm trying to advance here. There we go. Um, we actually <clears throat> had many children um, who would stay outside the libraries and pull up their, um, their uh, collapsible chairs and, and sit at picnic tables and, and do whatever they had to do in order to create, um, you know, the, to, to do their homework and, and to connect with their community, to, um, to send an email to a loved one. Um, equity and libraries go hand in hand when it comes to um, uh, technology access. And one of the things I wanted to illustrate is, is something that happened in Yolo County when I was county librarian there. In 2015, we got together with a number of partners with LAFCO, which is actually a lo local area forming um, a group that actually talks about the boundaries um, in cities and communities and counties. Um, we got together with our county IT department. Um, the library took a big lead in that. And the cities of Woodland, West Sacramento, Winters, and Davis, along with our local ISPs and elected representatives um, to actually create a countywide broadband plan. And you're wondering to yourself, well, what does this mean for in terms of equity? What we were looking at is, um, and just to give you some background, Yolo County is 210,000 people. 
Um, it, it encompasses the University of California at Davis. So there's strong higher ed, but then it's a huge economic um, agricultural area, which means two thirds of the population is agrarian and rural and low access. Um, and what we found very quickly is that we had to work together to make sure that our communities had stronger broadband, um, that it was low cost, that, was, that it was high, um, that it was robust. Because it wasn't just our community who, um, you know, our, our, our children, our teenagers, our students, um, the faculty that were coming into UC Davis, the, our, our communities at home, they needed all of that wonderful access, but it was also um, our agrarian community. Every single farmer in that community needed broadband in order to water um, their property, to irrigate, um, to, um, to, to plant, um, and to bring food to the table and to the market. Um, so we worked with all of those agencies um, and so the three cities and unincorporated areas to actually talk about uh, what our broadband needs were, what resources we could bring to the table. And the outcomes were this, among other things. All of our cities actually had ro robust internet access by the end of this because we were able to leverage that plan to get funding from a variety of places, but also to talk directly with ISPs to start providing that service. So it was a community need that actually we were able to address. We didn't just ask, um, and we worked through Scenic, which I'll talk about in a second, but we didn't just ask for 1G, we asked for 10. And we were able to get that um, in most of our county libraries. And that was directly through advocacy at the local, at the local level and at the statewide level. Our other partners included school districts, Yolo County Housing, Cal Fire, which of course we use their, um, the fire, um, all of our you know, rural uh, fire departments actually have uh, strong towers. And we actually were able to, to leverage that relationship. We worked with Valley Vision, which was our local internet um, uh, coalition, broadband coalition, um, and of course, Scenic. Um, I wanted to bring that to you because, as, as an illustration of partnerships because there is a number of things that we can do both nationally, locally, nationally, and internationally to leverage those relationships that libraries have. Libraries are one of the trusted agencies in our community. And we, we actually what we did together in this broadband plan at, at Yolo County was to bring all the right people to the table and have that conversation so that everybody benefited. Um, an illustration I have that I mentioned to Don the other day is that Wave Cable, one of our local ISPs, had about 500 yards of fiber optics in their backyard, literally in their backyard, and they hadn't had any plan for it right away. Um, they, we knew about that, that, that access, and we also know, knew that they needed to have stronger um, resources in actually West Sacramento. And so what we did was I connected our county IT department with Wave Cable and with our, um, with our, our, our neighborhood in West Sacramento and said, could you, if I could get you no permitting fees and be able to trench at no cost to you, um, to install that fiber optic cable between my library and the and, and a and a point um, at the you know at, at the county level, would you be able to do it? And you know they said yes. So they took half the strands for themselves, and the 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 library actually the county got other half the other half. No permitting fees. All the trenching was done internally. Um, so there's opportunities everywhere that we work in, um, in terms of making that leverage happen. Um, and I also wanted to put a shout out to our, uh, Cecilia Aguiar Curry is, is, was our mayor in winters at the time. She was a very strong proponent of this broadband plan and helped us plan it from beginning to end. She is now an assembly woman in, in the state of California advocating for libraries and broadband access all the time because of this relationship. One of, um, Don mentioned my relationship and, and different things I'm involved in. I'm also on, sit on the board of Scenic, uh, which is our Corporation for Education Network Initiatives. Um, Scenic does connect California to the world and, and I'll share with you what that means. 
basically scenic is our K-20 backbone um, in the state of California. So um, we represent uh, our charter associate members are the University of California, um, all of our California State University libraries, our community colleges, our K-12 system, and then the majority of public libraries in, in the state of California. 80% um, of our, of our uh, public libraries in California are connected through Scenic. What they do and what they're able to offer us is access to CalREN, which is 8,000 miles of optical fiber, connecting all of those institutions that I just talked about. We also, um, uh, you know, we also have a relationship um, with higher ed private institutions, the Post Naval Graduate School in Monterey, Stanford University, USC, and Caltech. And then some of our cultural institutional members are Monterey Bay Aquarium and SF Jazz and the Exploratorium and the Getty Museum. Um, but one of the one of the beauty uh, one of the beautiful things about this relationship is the connectivity that we all bring together through research and education, um, and that partnership deepens every single time we connect another agency to us because we all benefit from that relationship. Um, I've been able to stream SF Jazz concerts. Um, to my local community um, through that relationship. We've been, we've had um, actually um, some interesting um, events happen through the Monterey Bay Aquarium where we've actually seen, um, you know, a lot of the research and a lot of the work that they're doing at the aquarium with their scientists. Um, and, and that's all because of this relationship that we've developed through the partnership of deep, strong equity and access to, to digital broadband. Um, so what are local libraries doing now to better serve their communities? I know I've mentioned Santa Monica. I would be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't give a little bit of a, um, a shout out to my own city, which is one of the things that we've been able to do is through CityNet, um, which is our, our, our city broadband program, is pro provide direct connectivity to low-income housing units. Um, they would not have had point-to-point -point presence if we actually did not do that. Um, one of the things I mentioned to Don the other day is our library, you know, we've all been shuttered. We've all um, had to rethink about the different skills and services and, and training that we provide to the community. I, in my particular community, unfortunately, um, we've had to, we were reduced in the budget by 42%. Um, that's a huge drop in, 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 um, in economics for us. What has that meant for us? It means that we not, not only had to pivot, but we really had to rethink the way we do provide service. What, and we've had to close actually a couple of, of branches um, and we will not be reopening them fully to the public. However, one of the things that we're able to do is use this open plus model. Um, we got a grant from the California State Library, one of 10 in the state, to open um, one of our shuttered branches, we're going to reopen using an open plus model. It's a, it's, a, it's a service provided by Biblioteca. What it is is self-service. We actually provide a key card system. We ask the community to sign up saying they're gonna take good care of all of the things that they will encounter inside the library. It, it's attached to their library card. Once they say that they're gonna take good care and they get a little bit of training, they will be able to swipe their card come into the building and make use of the service. Um, we will have a, a few limited staff there because of for security reasons, but it, by and large, the community will be able to help themselves to their holds. They'll be able to print things, use the computer, use the bathroom, um, browse the collection and make use of, of many of the library services we would not be able to give to them. So technology and equity access has really been a big, um, <clears throat> part of our reopening conversations. And it's definitely been part of all of our local public libraries and, and, and schools and academics are actually thinking about exactly the same thing. Um, during the pandemic, um, obviously, you know, libraries have been meeting emergency and, and public health needs. Telehealth, telemed, it's all been part of our delivery service. We've been, um, we've been vaccination sites. We've been um, tracing centers. We've been, um, uh, we've done a lot of things, you know, and I know my colleague in, in San Francisco, part of his, uh, part of his, our, his branches um, 
we're open for childcare for first responders. Um, so there's lots of things that the library has been able to do to really um, provide the service that we need to in the moment that our community needs us the most. Um, obviously, <clears throat> one of the great things that we have ahead of us um, as a continual um, uh, need is the need for um, economic support for our communities as they rebuild, as, they, as we all regroup. Um, <clears throat> and that means that we need robust internet access um, for, for education. Uh, bringing back all of our, um, you know, our schools and our, our, our colleges and universities, um, the community needs as much robust technology as, as, as is possible. Um, I was telling Don, one of the things that happened in Santa Monica is that um, although every child in our school district uh, went home with a Chromebook, they didn't all get exactly the training, um, especially at, you know, at, at the parent and caregiver level that was really needed. Um, we, you know, in one of our communities, and um, thank you, Don, for actually um, sharing a picture uh, or a, a rendering of, of Pico Branch Library, which is one of our, our, our newest branch. Um, in the Pico community, we lost 300 families. And that's because we kept regular contact with the school district and, and our um, familia sonidas. And they said, you know, we can't find these kids. And, um, and so we decided actually not only to do some outreach to families um, throughout that neighborhood, but also um, offer um, in the moment technology programming, which means we actually asked can we help you with your device? Can we help you understand how it works? Can we, um, can we share with you parents um, technology ways in which to engage with your child, um, even if you have to stay at home um, through BrainFuse and a few of our um, databases, we were able to offer um, uh, the, the same processes that they might have received at school. Um, so we we actually regained some of those kids coming back. Um, yes, some of them actually had to leave Santa Monica because they could no longer afford to be there um, because they uh, the schools were not open because they had to rely on other resources to make their lives whole. But we were able to recapture the the um, and retain some of those young families that actually had left the system um, because the library was ready at the moment. Um, some libraries are providing um, Chromebooks, as well as training and education and hotspots, because the technology is not robust and we all don't have um, access. Adoption is is very hard, as you, as you know, um, in our in our communities throughout the world. Um, <clears throat> those, you know, one of the things that the pandemic created is the, some of the strongest unemployment numbers ever. And, and we are coming back, definitely. But people thought about re-careering. There were no longer things available to them. So those, um, those you know, uh, staff that were um, involved in the food industry, they had to have another way of actually engaging. Um, many of us offered um, services like Career Online High School and other kinds of jobs now, a lot of different ways in which we could rebuild the economy for our community um, by making sure that our, our community had robust internet access for those, uh, for those resources. Um, the library is also home to um, a lot of food distribution um, and, and doing different things to really keep our community engaged. But we need to actually share that information a lot, quite a bit, um, through electronic and, and digital means. And then of course, um, uh, instruction and training and, and the service delivery changed quite a bit. Um, as those of us who actually, as, as Don mentioned with the Gensler list, um, we spent a lot of time redesigning our programming and our delivery of those systems, reinvesting in our collections um, um, and, not actually abandoning the printed word because we knew we were going to come back, but spending a lot more money on the digital resources that we have available. Um, reopening is going to be very tough for all of us, but we're we're anxious to get started and re um, and and align ourselves with with our community needs um, and spend a lot of time talking to our public. I think above all, you know, one of the things that I, we mentioned we mentioned to our community and. Um, and our staff is that what our public has said that they miss the most 
when we've talked to them is actually engagement with our team. They miss that interaction. They miss communicating with our with our um, with our staff who are not only knowledgeable um, and and provide great reference and readers advisory, but also that human connection is so key. Um, it's it's really it's really made a big difference. And frankly, all of our staff, for the most part, are are very anxious to come back to work. Um, so we're all doing reopening plans. We're all thinking about social distancing. But one of the things that I wanted to kind of point out, and that's a hallmark of what I'm trying to do in my future work with ALA, is to think about it from an equity perspective, digital equity, but equity as a whole. When we're thinking about policies and procedures, um, time limits for people to come in. Um, are we actually creating barriers in our policies that actually in our process that might not invite everyone to come back? And so to think about that um, with all of the customers that, and, and the broadest sense of community um, in terms of making a difference in, in people's lives, especially the most vulnerable um, in, our, in our community that is unsheltered. Um, so I just kind of put in a plug for that. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be working on in, in um, I, I, we've been at this for a while and, and I, I take the helm in, in July, uh, but in all honesty, I think I've been working on this throughout my entire career, which is how to provide more equity through service. And of course that includes um, our digital representation and our, and our access points. Um, but advocacy is one of the ways in which libraries and library workers tell the story of the difference they make every day. And um, who better to do that than our frontline staff and our community as a whole? Because as Don mentioned you know, to me this morning, if there's a few things that you can remember about my presentation, it's the story. What is important to you? What is resonating with you? How does it, how does it reflect our current experience and what difference can we make? Um, those are the things that I'll, I'll be talking about in the next few minutes when, when we talk about ALA um, and, and what we're trying to do there. Um, one of the things we were able to pass um, uh, at our at our last meeting um, at ALA is the concept of universal broadband as a human right. Um, you know, and I know that I've seen the mantle, you know, at Loida uh, Garcia Febo, who a former ALA president and very strong um, IFLA um, advocate, ambassador, and and all around um, wonderful person. I know that she's using it also in all of her talks now um, throughout the world because broadband, you know, is is as um, is as vital to us as electricity as it is to water. It is one of the primary ways that our community um, gets information, uh, and and it will continue to be relied upon as as a real critical part of our success. Um, as we restore our economy, as we rebuild our future. So it's very important um, that, we, that we can speak with almost one voice and advocate for, um, for digital equity, um, but an universal broadband um, as, as something that we all not only deserve, um, but that, we, that uh, we are entitled to as, as human beings um, in, in the world. Um, the, the, the one critical area I think that we also need to think about is, is that broadband is also not only um, something that's relevant to our success as individuals and as communities, but it's also a matter of creating sustainability in the world. Um, and, and, you know, IFLA and, and ALA um, are, are really, and the UN are really strong proponents of information access and broadband as critical to creating sustainable communities and sustainable economies. Um, we can't really, um, you know, everything is intertwined now. And, and that's our story of togetherness in terms of working, working well. Um, language is so important. One of the great things that, um, and I just was on a Reforma uh, conference with a couple of colleagues from Australia and um, Romania and, and Japan. And um, our, my Japanese colleague actually said some very important things um, as, as it pertains to broadband in that we also have a responsibility to confidentiality and privacy. Everything is integrated. Um, she, she gave a wonderful story about how they're responding in the COVID environment. 
Um, but what was very interesting um, to us to learn is that the government at the time actually insisted um, in, during, in doing contract tracing and other things in retaining the information. So that confidentiality and the privacy safeguards were front, front and center for her as, um, as a, an I, um, LIS professor, but as someone who was maintaining um, a little bit of monitoring at how public libraries and, and, and libraries in general had to share information at the government level and how that information was, was being retained and used um, and, and cautioned us, and rightly so, that we needed to remain vigilant in our communication with our, our communities um, and, our, and our governance structures, that confidentiality and privacy and intellectual freedom are all hand in hand. Um, and are pivotal to libraries in, in terms of the work we need to do together. So language, use of language is very important. Um, one of the things that um, I'm hoping to do uh, through ALA is also convene um, international experts who have done such great work in terms of adoption that we could all take, um, uh, take pointers from at the, at the US level because they've, uh, they've been able to actually um, um, work through um, uh, offering universal broadband uh, to as many community members as possible in a low cost, economically beneficial way for everyone. Um, and I think, you know, Audrey Tang in Taiwan is actually one of those leaders. Um, and we hope to bring her and have some meetings with our FCC because we really need to get um, together on, on, on these issues. Um, I did want to spend a little bit of time, and I know that um, time is running short, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, digital equity as it pertains to legislation. Uh, but I also wanted to make sure I thanked all of you again, um, and our legislators and advocates, um, and especially our public policy and advocacy team in Washington, DC. So I wanted to talk a little bit in more detail about a few of the things that we have ahead of us in terms of funding opportunities. Um, because now more than ever, universal broadband and digital access is actually a bipartisan issue. It's kind of a different um, and important role that we all play um, as library leaders in this country right now um, uh, to help schools and libraries provide. So the FCC has this great emergency connectivity fund. It's part of um, it's part of ARPA. Um, it's really to help schools and libraries provide de devices and connectivity to students, schools. Uh, school staff and library patrons during the pandemic. So there's $7.172 billion. Um, so the FCC um, right now is negotiating the final rules for the program. Uh, we will, ALA will provide a full analysis of the details as soon as we know them. Um, and then we'll have, a, of course, a web page dedicated to the program when um, uh, ECF launches this this summer including one pages for library staff and, and our patrons. Um, so keep, keep that in mind. Um, and, and, uh, and in the chat, I think I, I'll, I'll um, be able to, to list some, um, some URLs um, very shortly as soon as I can. Um, um, the emergency broadband benefits is a temporary program. Um, and, and it's an FCC program also to help families and households struggle who are struggling to afford internet service during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's $3.2 billion available there for qualifying households um, uh, to provide this monthly discount uh, of the cost of broadband service. Um, so a few pointers on this, it's up to $50 a month discount for broadband service. It's up to $75 a month for discount for households on qualifying tribal lands and a one-time discount of up to $100 for a laptop, a desktop, a computer, or a tablet purchased through a participating provider if the household contributes more than $10, but less than $50 to the purchase price. So this will help with adoption a lot. Um, uh, the program is geared toward uh, families with low incomes as defined by various federal standards. Um, one thing to keep in mind, especially for academic um, and community college libraries is that the students who received the federal Pell Grant during the current 
year, award year are eligible for this emergency broadband benefit. Um, anchor institutions like libraries will be key in public awareness. So that's part of our getting this out. And I was so glad when Don um, invited me because it was an, an it enabled me to actually promote um, promote this through through the work today. Um, so the FCC has. Um, they also have some excellent resources. They've got social media assets, flyers, posters, um, infographics, newsletter blurbs, everything you really could need to know about that. And I'll, like I said, I'll post the link um, in the chat in, in just a second. Um, building America's Libraries Act, um, we're so excited about this. Um, we're working hard on um, gaining co-sponsors for the Build America's Libraries Act. It's a piece of legislation that ALA helped craft um, and many, many thanks um, to, to Senator Reed, uh, Jack Reed, along with um, Senator Sanders and Senator Whitehouse um, and Senator um, uh, Wyden, because it really is on, on so many levels, um, a, a really broad way of investment in our, in our libraries. Um, even though libraries have been rock stars for their communities, um, especially during the pandemic, we also know that many library facilities don't come to close, don't come close, excuse me, to reflecting what their community needs. Um, so we really want to make sure that actually, in addition to um, some, of the, some of the broadband infrastructure we've also talked about, that libraries can actually renovate and remodel um, their buildings so that we can provide stronger support to all of our communities. We have a one pager with details about the bill on our Build America's Library Act website on the ALA.org and what the funding could be used for, but it also includes, and of course this is also very exciting for me too, it includes upgrading broadband equipment and technology hardware. So I'm just gonna say that again, because I, I think everybody thinks this is really just bricks and mortar. It is also infrastructure. So um, it's, it's very important that, that we keep all of this in our mind as, there, you know, as the money kind of grows. And it does mean a couple of things. Libraries also need to be ready. So one of the ways that our chapters can, can assist with us and, and, um, and our, our regional consortia um, and we hope Gigabit, uh, Gigabit um, Libraries Network is actually to encourage libraries to get them resources so they can help plan for receiving this money. Um, more on the Build America's Libraries Act. Funding would be distributed through um, IMLS to state library agencies. Um, state libraries would then award grants on a competitive basis to libraries in each state. Funding would be prioritized to libraries um, serving marginalized communities such as high poverty areas. IMLS would provide funding directly to tribal libraries. So that's the caveat. Tribal libraries would have their own application um, strategy and um, IMLS would distribute through state libraries that would uh, then redistribute to our, our local communities. Um, the last thing I wanted to, oh, this is not true. I have one more thing. Um, the best chance to pass the, the Build America's Libraries Act is to roll it out into the infrastructure package. So know that this is not done deal, right? It's not, it's not finalized yet. It's not, it's not made into law. Um, Biden introduced his infrastructure plan in March and recently Senate Republicans offered a much slimmer plan. So far, unfortunately, none of those proposals include libraries. Um, we're glad that the administration has brought focus to modernizing our infrastructure, um, but our White House and the Congress need to be um, are part of the, our nation's infrastructure and the time to invest in libraries is now. Um, so it's up to us to tell our library stories to decision makers at all levels of government. Um, and you can go to our webpage, um, ala.org um, slash advocacy slash build libraries to find out if your members of, the, of Congress have, have co-sponsored the bill. But if they haven't, um, please email um, President Biden and your members of Congress about the Build America's Libraries. Um, this is the largest amount of money that has been put into library infrastructure in many years, in decades. Um, so we need to, to take the time we can to advocate for it. Um, it just so happens that next week is, is National United for Infrastructure Week. 
So there's a little plug for that. The Public Awareness Week presents an opportunity for libraries to position ourselves as critical infrastructure in our communities. Um, ALA's public policy and advocacy team has created some templates to help you showcase your library um, and your infrastructure successes and needs. Uh, we're, using the hash, we're using the hashtag build libraries. Um, pictured here is a post by Blue Island Library in Illinois. They're already gearing up for United for Infrastructure Week. Um, the Bill for America's Library, uh, Libraries Act is, is really critical groundbreaking legislation. Um, it would pave the way for new and improved library facilities in underserved communities across the country. So I hope you'll join us in supporting this bill. I'm sorry, did somebody have? Okay. Um, and if you do want to uh, stay updated, you can follow our public policy and advocacy Twitter account, and it's at library policy. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say one more thing, which is that for the first time, um, ALA is doing a regranting program. This is the largest one I think that we've had in quite a while. We've done others, but this one in particular is for COVID relief for libraries. We have $1.25 million available. It's available for public and school libraries who have had some economic downturn as a result of COVID. So anyone that's experienced substantial economic hardship due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, the grants are available in $30,000 to $50,000 increments, depending on what your needs happen to be. The deadline for submission is May 20th of this year, so not very much time, but enough time. Um, and the award will be announced June 23rd and implementation by December 31st. And once again, I'll put all of that in the chat, um, or if I haven't actually been able to get around to all of it, I will make sure that I provide it to Dawn and we can knit it together, I hope, with the recording today. Um, I wanted to thank all of you. I know I ran through a lot of information, but I, I'm very excited um, and, and very um, I'm happy to share some of these ideas and these opportunities with you. Um, and we're looking forward to a wonderful year as ALA president, but I also want to personally invite you to please contact me um, if there's any way that I can benefit you. Um, it's, it, my information is here. And, um, and remember that you know, we, all, we need all of us actually to maintain um, that commitment to digital equity through, through our resources. Thank you. Wow, Patty. Uh, <laughs> speaking of advocacy, I think you've just done a serious piece of it right there. Uh, this, uh, this recording will be up uh, by Monday, maybe earlier, but Monday the latest, and you'll have a chance to uh, listen to this again and maybe take more notes. Uh, you touched on so many things, Patty, that we'd love to follow up on. One of the points you made was uh, about libraries, demand for library services increases dramatically in times of crisis. We saw that after the financial crash 10 years ago, more. And, and again, now people just turn to the library when they're in distress and when they're in need, uh, because where else, right? Uh, and so libraries need to be ready for that. One thing I want to ask you about uh, the YOLO uh, county project so fascinating that 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 everybody was able to come together across those jurisdictions and and develop a plan. One of the key things that struck me was uh, you you said you discovered this dark fiber. The was there a way that you inventoried all the various assets? You said the towers and so forth. Was there a process for inventorying assets that might flow into that plan? So that's a great question, Don. Um, it, it what it helps to do is actually get be, be very nosy and ask all of the people about what fiber is available in the community. So I will tell you, we did a couple of things. I talked to my county IT folks, um, but what, I also talked to important partners in the community. I talked to our tribe. I talked to. Um, Hi, the, um, I talked to all of our city infrastructure folks. So if you talk to your public works department, <laughs> departments, they actually know where the fiber is laid, but nobody really asked them the question. Uh -huh. So, so and, and I will tell you, the other thing that you need to think, know about dark fiber is that they also pay taxes on them. 
So if you can trace it back with your taxing body, you can actually, and as a county, I was, I had a little bit more access, I will say, than some of the cities, but you have to ask the right questions. So we asked where things were laid and who owned that property. But one of the things that our public works departments do throughout is they know where there's undergrounding. They also know where things are above ground. If you ask the right questions, there was no big list of here's where all the dark fiber is. There was, I had to actually do a lot of homework and, and it wasn't just me. It was everyone that you saw listed in that, in that group. We all kind of went out and said, okay, who do we know? Who, what kind of relationships can we leverage to get the information about what's laid now and who owns it and who hasn't lit it up? Can we have the conversation? And I will tell you, it started with Tom West from Scenic who came to us and we were not Scenic Libraries at the time. We became Scenic Libraries after that. But, um, and he said to me, um, I know that you have dark fiber and I've talked already to Wave and Frontier and other ISPs and, I, and, and can we come through YOLO because we wanna do some work on the other side of you. And we said, well, instead of actually coming through us, why don't we work together? Um, because that's what it takes. You know, I mean, I will tell you, there was a little bit of strong arming for a little bit. And I said, you know, this is silly. Why do we need to do this? You need to, we need to work together. And so I, I will tell you, then I became on some levels, some of the strongest proponents of Scenic as an ambassador for them and the linear as a board member, because, um, I have been able to do things I wouldn't able to be able to do because of the relationship. So for instance, one of the, one of the branches in Yolo County had, had only T1 lines and they are surrounded by water. So you can understand what I'm talking about when there really is no access there. Um, and so we, um, we talked about point to point presence. We talked about, um, Underground cabling would have meant about $4 million. Nobody wants to do that, right? Um, what does that mean then in order to get um, to Clarksburg residents and that community? How do I get them robust internet access above T1? Because T1 is nothing, right? So you need to kind of think creatively about who else has relationships there. I would actually then, I turned to Sacramento Public Library and I said, you are, you serve Cortland, which is right over the hill from Clarksburg. When you get something, you tell me. That's how those relationships work. And I, I, I can't impress upon our libraries uh, that are listening to this, that you do have the relationships on, on some levels already. You just have to kind of open your mind to thinking about it a little differently. Um, work with your internet service providers. They sometimes are a little hard because they're also a vendor, right? Um, but, they, but they also know where they're doing work. And so if they're um, cabling their local school district, then have a conversation about what that might look like. Many of our libraries in California actually have that relationship already where they're going in together with the school district or they're going in with another agency. Um, and we just need to leverage that conversation. But that's really the premise of, of that YOLO ex example. Very cool. I, I hope that's a, a case study written up somewhere. It, it certainly should be. And because it's, it's not only it's just generally relevant, I think it's relevant in the context of what you pointed out, this Rebuild Libraries Act uh, is it, going to look at a lot of that. It also is relevant to our session next week. We're going to have a couple of architects talking about design and spaces and so forth. It's, that's all very relevant right now. And uh, please put any of those links in the chat so that people might take action today. Um, we started late uh, and, and we uh, uh, are, are gonna turn to uh, Stephen here. Uh, we're gonna go maybe a little bit over a one hour period. We, this is not a TV show, so we're not strict on the time, but we appreciate everybody staying around. So now we're going to, uh, I had more questions, Patty, though, just gonna have to wait. <laughs> but now we're gonna kind of that's Step right. back one more level and uh, surround Santa Monica and the U.S. with the globe, which is, of course, the environment we're all living in happily or less so, depending. Uh, and so, Stephen, welcome as a, 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 as a respondent to Patty and as a representative of uh, IFLA and as our longtime partner in advocating for public access. Universal public access is what Stephen and I have been working on for a number of years. 
So Stephen, uh, take it away. If you have Thank questions you, to Patty and, and back up, introduction of IFLA. First, please. Yes, so, so I was going to say, first of all, thank you, Patty, for all your words. I was, I was really enjoying talking to you and really learning a lot from it. So I'll try and keep my words short so we can get back to you as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, also congratulations on your election as ALA president, and, and we're looking forward to you taking up the role shortly. So it's going to be a whole pile more work, which is good. Um, I suppose I, I want to say, firstly, it, it's great to see a focus on connectivity that as ALA president you're, you'll be putting such a focus on connectivity and really seeing this underlining connectivity as, as the logical continuation of library's mission to promote meaningful access to information for all and um, often I know it's very easy to get caught up in the tech clash and I don't know we often we, we certainly see this in a lot of the debates right now that the internet is seen as a mixed thing not necessarily positive and so it's so valuable to actually have someone at, at your level pushing, underlining that, okay, technology is neutral, but if people aren't connected in the first place, that's really, the, I don't know, that's the number one problem that we still need to be focusing on. Um, in terms of IFLA's role at the international level, um, I guess some things happen at the international level. There are some decisions that do take place globally which do have an influence. And so, for example, earlier this week, we saw President Biden's announcement on promoting a, a waiver to the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property, the COVID vaccines. And so there's this possibility sometimes at the international level to take these big decisions, which really will make a difference immediately on the ground. However, so much international work is rather about, it's providing the influence, it's providing the peer pressure, it's providing the references, that can support governments nationally in taking decisions that are way more favorable to libraries. And in that, things that happen at the UN, things that happen at UNESCO, the World Intellectual Property Organization and so on, these are just part of the toolkit that you have on the national level in order to get your way. Now, as it comes to policy, it's a fantastic thing for politicians if they're trying to push forward something that sounds a bit controversial, be able to point to another country and say well they did it and it was fine I, I come from the UK uh, and so for a long time we had the, the government which is still actually the government now was pushing charter schools and it loved pointing to the US and Sweden to say well the US has done it and Sweden has done it and that was effectively that, that allowed them to get away with a lot now they're probably a, probably a mixed thing certainly the opinion in the UK is that charter schools aren't such a good idea anymore it hasn't worked as well as everyone expected but there are so many positive things where we can learn from each other where being able to point to those examples from one country can be helpful and so a key role of IFLA is encouraging this sharing encouraging this focus on good ideas good practices that can be relevant we're trying to work for organizations like the UN like UNESCO like the OECD to share these great examples, in particular in that space of bringing about this understanding that universal access, universal broadband access, it is a public good. If we don't do anything, there will be market failure. We can't mm -hmm. leave this to the market. Um, it's not something that, partly because everyone has a right to information, partly because it's only by having access to information sometimes that people can get into a position to be able to afford it for themselves. It's a similar thing to education. We offer free education because you can't expect a five-year-old to value education enough to pay for it. You can't expect everyone to value it enough or to have the resources to be able to pay for it. That's why we need to make sure there's this consensus. Um, I wanted to say as well that also I really valued the, the, the focus on, on advocacy, partly because it's in my, my job title. And so it's always good to think that I'm working on something that, that's useful, <laughs> that's valuable. Um, I think another function at the international level is this sharing of ideas. And you know, advocacy is, it's not a science, it's more a social science. So it's a bit of a science, but not entirely. Um, Advocacy depends so much on who you're talking to, on the structure you're working within, on the resources that you have. And we're convinced at IFLA, and we make this point very strongly, that every librarian can be an advocate. Every librarian has skills, has energies, has information, has knowledge that can contribute 
to a comprehensive advocacy campaign. Of course, but it varies from sector to sector. And so it's only by really coming together by talking about what works that we can actually get there. And in that, there's so much we can share across countries, across borders. There's so many stories, so many arguments, so many ways of thinking about things that we can learn from. So uh, it, it, I, don't know, I hope, I know there's so much great stuff going on in the state. All of those examples, the fantastic examples of library infrastructure work, how far you've got already, and fingers crossed that it will come to term, that it will all get agreed on. All of the success in pushing for greater support for libraries, for keeping IMLS funded year after year during the yes. Trump presidency, which is not nothing. Um, there's so much success that's come out of the US, so much that can actually be shared. Um, but also, and it's an issue you touched on from time to time, the value of hopefully of IFLA as being a place where we can exchange on some of those really tough questions actually so the question of universal broadband we do not have an infinite budget um, how can you provide universal broadband and importantly how can you provide universal broadband alongside the devices alongside the skills alongside the content that makes it meaningful so being able to talk about those sorts of things and being able to advocate and make the case for that Issues around equity. We are learning things about equity all of the time. You, you mentioned yourself that equity has been a career for you. Mm -hmm. Equity is something that we are learning about all the time. There are so many, the debate in different countries varies. It's at different stages. I think in the US, you've got a lot further than a lot of other countries. There's so much we can actually learn from each other about how can we do equity? What do you need to bear in mind? What, I don't know. What are, how are we, can we actually get there? And so using this international platform, this international space to actually progress on that is super important. And the final thing, just returning to the advocacy point, and that was leading to the question that I was going to get to. I know that we struggle a lot around the world, that you know, libraries are seen probably far too often as just being an intrinsic good. It is a good thing to have a library in your community. And the problem is, far too often they're then seen in isolation. They're not connected with other things. I know, I know there's a lot of concern within the field that we tend to be jacks of all trade and masters of none. We do a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of that, and that we don't purely belong. We don't belong to a health department in a way. And I'm sounding very European here because it's not quite the same in the US, obviously. We don't entirely belong to a health department like a hospital might belong to a health department. We don't entirely belong to an education or a human services department like a school would do. And so being able to advocate, being able to get ourselves onto the radar of these partners is something that needs to happen throughout the world. We can't just rely, we can't take for granted the idea that people like libraries because people do like libraries, we know that. But that doesn't mean they're going to act. That doesn't mean they're going to prioritize us over a desire to cut budgets. It doesn't mean they're going to prioritize us against the need to support something else. And so getting onto the agenda, making sure that politicians see us as part of their agenda, as a tool, as a supporter, as a partner in actually achieving their goals is super important, which leads me to the question I was going to ask after quite a sort of roundabout bit of talking. It, it, it's getting a sense from you of, how you build those partnerships, how you've been so successful in convincing, um, convincing education partners, convincing health partners, convincing all these other partners to see you as part of their space, part of their ecosystem, as an essential way, as an essential partner in actually achieving their goals, because I think that's a challenge that we're all going to see around the world. You know, serious. Stephen, that's a great, can I respond, Don? Is, is that okay? Um, so those are great. I mean, I, I loved everything you said. Thank you so much, and and I, I look forward to working with IFLA more closely on all of those things. Uh, part of my own experience is actually finding out um, what is important to those partners. Um, it also is. You know, one of the things that you mentioned is the library is actually um, on so many levels, 
the great bridge builder, right? I mean, we, we connect people to information. We connect um, partners together. Sometimes we connect folks and then we get out of the way, right? Um, but part of our leadership role in terms of research and investigation and information sharing is actually finding out what resonates with our partners um, and seeing how the library can best benefit. I mean, our role as, as a community link is actually to make sure that everyone's successful in that community. Um, and we don't have to own all of those pieces, but by and large, we actually can connect the pieces together. So uh, because we actually are not only a trusted and neutral, not neutral in the sense of, you know, but we provide some balance to all of the information that we provide, um, but we're also interested in creating social good and, um, and being that link for so many people. Um, so when we actually talk to our partners, uh, whether they're elected officials or um, they're the public health department or um, they're the, the parent um, or the teacher or you know the su school superintendent in front of you, um, they are also looking for what's important to them. They're not realizing actually on many levels that the library can provide that extra oomph, whatever that oomph is. Um, so we have to kind of develop the relationship, which is why I began with relationships and I ended up with partners. So there's, um, you need to show authenticity um, and, and, uh, and, been, and then follow through. Um, I, I think some of the best work that, we've, that I've ever done has been through um, you know, our communities and our, our partners understanding that the library can leverage many, many things. We don't have to be front and center. Um, we can be an ally. Um, we can uh, help create and innovate. Um, we can be that, you know, um, so right now, even in Santa Monica, I have, we have lots of partners who come to the library right away because they know not only that we're, uh, we keep our word, <laughs> Um, but we also are part of an infrastructure that involves the rest of the city. So even though um, we don't, we are sometimes seen as separate, um, our local arts community comes to us all the time because they, they know that we have a, a, an out of the box sometimes thinking about creating um, art and, and cultural engagement. And, and they can, we can reach some of the members in the community who haven't thought about them before, but likewise, we can also reach more members of the community that we haven't been able to reach. The partnership is mutually beneficial. And when you can show that agency that um, the library is not only well-intentioned and a part of the common good, um, and that we have so much more to, to, um, to benefit from when we're working together. Um, you know, when I was in Yolo County, we, um, we, we, our, our, our adoption rate was pretty low. And um, in many places, I think it was one in every three households that actually didn't have any internet access or any devices at home. Um, that's a lot of, of, of people not having anything. So we worked with our local ISPs um, to actually offer that deeper broadband discount and to stretch it out a little longer to get people interested in adoption. We actually um, gave away, um, uh, we worked with um, a computer um, re reuse center to, who were building computers and teaching people how to build them. Um, and we were able to get low cost computers um, to our neighborhoods. We actually had a big drive um, and, and communities all over, you know, uh, got them for like 25 or $50. I mean, it was like nothing. Um, I, I think what you need to show is that there's, uh, that the, as a trusted entity, the library really can make a difference and, and continues to, um, to represent the community and, and, and our communities in, a, in a, an entirely different way, especially around engagement. This is a great setup for a whole session on advocacy. It's one of the biggest challenges uh, for librarians as, you know, as uh, uh, civil servants to be activists. It's a kind of a conflict uh, at one level 
they need the community to be their their advocates for them as well and and they generally could benefit from being more assertive about their their value but i think what it comes down to is from steven's point and your response patty is the library being seen as essential as opposed to just great and wonderful which is nobody's going to argue about that i mean a lot of people won't say it's that great but nobody's going to say it's unnecessary i mean it's it's just trivial but how is it essential it is essential that the water flows it is essential that electricity is on it is essential we have police get to that level of understanding and appreciation is a real tough one especially for uh, an entity that does so many things that builds these bridges having an understanding of the value of those bridges is really something uh that we're gonna try to help create a, a, a framework for uh we are a bit over here uh this is great we'll uh we'll hang out for a little while but we're gonna close the recording now but before we do i'd like to ask everybody to unmute if you would unmute everybody unmute please thank you because we were all together as we hopefully will be again one time and we got these great presentations from patty and steven we'd give them a round of applause so that's what we're gonna do right now everybody please give them a round of applause for our speakers Absolutely. thank you thank you Oh, that's great. That's great. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to conclude the recording now. Stephen, thank you.